Hello, it's Adriana again. As I mentioned in my previous talk on DNA barcoding workflows, I would cover in more depth the barcode of live data systems, or bold in short, the platform created specifically to host DNA barcoding data. It's going to be a bit longer than my previous talk since Bold is a complex platform and I'd like to touch on many features, but my hope is that you will not only become curious to browse the platform, but that you will understand some of its advantages, but also some of its limitations. And I have to mention that some figures that you will see here were provided by the Bold team and I'm very thankful to them for being so helpful. Just to give an overview of the talk, I'll have an introduction to Bold and then I'll focus on data, how to generate it, how to validate it, how to analyze it in Bold, and I'll end with data lifecycle. This is a screenshot of the latest version of Bold, version 4, which was released in 2017. You can find the website at boldsystems.org. So what is Bold? By now, you know it's a database holding, what else than data, of course. But I'll show you that it's actually much more than just a simple database. Dissecting Bold, we see in this figure that one of its components is the DNA barcode database that I keep mentioning. It is true that most sequences uploaded to Bold belong to the barcode regions. However, believing that Bold holds only barcode data is a misconception. Additional markers can be uploaded as well, and the list is constantly growing based on users' requests. And now, just a quick reminder that the official barcode regions, according to the international barcoding community, are kingdom-specific and are limited to cytochrome oxidase 1 in animals, Rubisco and Maturas K in plants, and the internal transcribed spacer in fungi. Of course, during this training, you will be using DNA barcoding in a more flexible way, since you will be working with groups such as bacteria and phytoplasmas, but I just wanted to give you a reminder about the official barcodes. Based on this database of barcodes, Bold offers an identification service, which is the tool that you will be mostly using in this training. But a component that makes Bold unique is that it offers a space to users, a workbench where they can assemble data, analyze it and publish it. I'll talk about each of these three parts and I'll start with the database. There are a few databases that can be accessed by anybody without an account. As you can see here, there is a public data portal, a bin database, a constantly growing database with publications using DNA barcoding and a primer database. The largest one is the one hosting all public data. To do some data mining in this part, you need to search the database based on a specific term, whether it's taxonomy or geography, or even the institution storing the vouchers, and then download the results. In this case, I searched for Peru and I found more than 17,000 public records available for this country. And now I can just go and download the data in a certain format and analyze it with whatever software I would like. I'll move to talk briefly about the identification engine since this is the part of most interest to you for the practical session of this training, but also for the work that you do at your home institutions. The database used for identification purposes has millions of barcodes, more than 5 million and probably by the time of this talk, maybe closer to 6 million barcodes. And as you can see in this figure, most of them belong to the animal kingdom, more precisely to the insect group. The other kingdoms are much less represented. There are a few reasons for this. DNA barcoding was initially proposed for the animal kingdom and more effort has been dedicated to this kingdom. And with regards to insects, they are the most diverse animal group according to the current knowledge, but they also benefit from having a very large community of dedicated entomologists. So how does it work? First, choose one of the three kingdoms, then choose the database of interest all barcode records or just the ones that have species names and then paste your sequence into the search box and click submit. 
This service is available without an account, but limited to queries of one sequence at a time. With an account, it is now possible in Bold 4 to do batch searches with hundreds of sequences at a time and receive the results through email. So what does happen when you click Submit? There is a page that will open with results and it will show the matched name in the database and the percent of similarity. In this case, the sequence belongs to Seratitis capitata, or so it seems. Although the first line up here gives Seratitis capitata as the best ID with 100% similarity, and although I see many names here, many matches for Seratitis capitata with 100% similarity, the system also tells me that there is a second species, Seratitis caetrata, so close according to genetic distances that my sequence could belong to any of these two species. I chose this example first because it was a pest species, but also to show that sometimes it's not enough to look at the first line and make an informed decision, especially in a regulatory context in which all of you work. So how to troubleshoot? Check the tree-based ID option. The tree displays the 100 closest matches to the query sequence, which is in red here, the unknown specimen. In blue are the records mined from GemBank, and in black, the bold records. And then start asking questions. How frequent is the second species name in the tree? Ceratitis caetrata. In this case, there were 12 records out of 100 identified as caetrata. The next questions. Is it possible that there was a misidentification somewhere in bold? Or is it a lab-related issue such as cross-contamination? Or is there a misspelling error? Are these two species synonyms? Are they closely related species that cannot be separated by genetic distances in CO1 and additional markers are needed? These are all things that you need to take into account while you follow your protocol. And now I'll move to talk about the most exciting part for any researcher and not only, and this is the workbench provided by Bolt. Hopefully you will get a picture of how complex the DNA barcoding approach is and how issues occurring at different steps in a certain lab or research group can impact the outcome of an analytical workflow in a different lab or regulatory agency such as yours. To access the workbench, an account is needed, and that is for data security. But the account is free and quick to set up. Once you log in, you see a console like this one up here, and this is the command panel for your work. Now, you need to understand that data cannot just freely float in Bolt. Data needs to be hosted in projects. So the first step is to create a project, and the person who does that becomes the project manager and has power to give access or to cancel access to various collaborators and different levels of access too. This slide is a reminder of the barcoding workflow with the front end part and its associated data uploaded to Bold and then the molecular part and its associated data uploaded to Bold. And this is what a Bold record looks like. Each record will have two pages, one with all the specimen data on the left and a second page with all the information related to the lab part on the right. The specimen page will host the image, will host all the information regarding, regarding the taxonomy, the voucher itself, the collection data, and then an activity log, bottom left, with all the people who modified that particular record. And the sequence page will hold the electropherograms and the nucleotide sequences that are uploaded by users. And then for protein coding genes, Bold will translate the sequence into amino acids and will display the amino acid sequence. Um, there is a direct link to GemBank through the accession number here. And then the sequence page also offers the possibility to access the Bolt 
ID engine directly from here. To summarize, there are four types of files to be uploaded to Vault. Specimen data as spreadsheet, images as JPEG, sequences as FASTA files, and traces as ABI files. Currently, Bold allows data for about 50 fields, but if this is not enough, users can opt to insert custom fields into their projects, such as maybe regulatory interests or anything else that seems fit. Once data is in Bold, it needs to be validated. Bold offers a few very helpful validation tools, but ultimately, it is the responsibility of the Bold users to clean and curate their data. Specimen data is validated by the Bold team before being uploaded to Bold. As for sequence data, if there are sequences with stop colons or sequences matching the contaminant database, which includes human sequences, cow, pig, some bacterial sequences such as Wolbachia, these sequences will be automatically flagged by the system. Additionally, records can be flagged upon request if users find signs of contamination or image mix-up or misidentification, for instance. But the important part to remember here is that these flagged records are completely removed from the identification engine. So you don't need to worry about the flagged records for your work, but just keep in mind that there might be records in need of flagging that have not been detected by the time you run your analysis and you need to account for this in your workflow. Besides the automated tools, there are some integrated tools in Bold, such as the, the neighbor joining tree that you can build, where you can see if sequences bearing different species names cluster in the same group. You can also plot a map to check the accuracy of your GPS data. And you can also compile all your images in a library to check for errors, such as image mix-up. Independent validation comes from other sources outside of the Bold tools. For instance, errors found in the original files or misidentifications or synonymy detected outside of Bold. And with all this, I hope it is very clear for all of you why data validation is important and how it can impact your work as end users, even without a Bold account. And just remember the, um, the Ceratitis Capitata example from a few slides before. To visualize some of the things I already mentioned, there are, there are a few tools in Bold. The tree, the neighbor joining tree used to visualize records, the map that I mentioned, the image library. For the analytical part, there are other tools like um, plots where you can see the relationship between maximum intraspecific and the nearest neighbor, for instance, here. Um, you can also build an accumulation curve to see the breadth of the sampling effort and when, and when the plateau is reached. Um, you can see the relationship between geographic distances and genetic distances. And in Bold 4, there are, there are a lot of analytical tools that I will not present here um, in detail. Down here, we have a figure depicting the network of Bold users and the level of collaboration between them. Red color means those users are sharing more than 100,000 records. Of course, this figure is not part of the analytical toolbox in Bold, and you probably figured it out by now. You can't really talk about Bold anymore without talking about the barcode index number or BIN developed for Koan sequences. It is a system which provides an algorithm for sequence clustering called RESL or Refined Single Linkage Algorithm. It consists of three steps, an alignment of all sequences in Bold, then an initial clustering based on a distance threshold set at 2.2%, followed by refinement based on Markov clustering with an optimality criterion. Basically, the threshold value is revisited for those beans that show some sequence variation, so that in the end, there will be beans separated by less than 2.2%, and there will be beans with an intra-bean divergence higher than 2.2%. 
And I can't stress enough the fact that there is no universal genetic threshold for species delimitation across all animal kingdom. All Cohen sequences in bold are clustered once a month at this point. It is an automatic process which results in a list of OTUs, operation, Operational Taxonomic Units or BINs, each OTU with a unique identifier consisting of three letters and four numbers that I have here on the slide, um, and which is a major advantage over other clustering processes or software in terms of data manipulation. Beans are persistent, but not permanent. They are persistent, meaning this bean, bold AAA3297, that I have here, which belonged to Ceratitis capitata one year ago, but also to Ceratitis caetrata, if you remember our exercise for the, the bold ID engine. So this bean still shows the same names, although the algorithm, it's been rerun every month. However, bins are not permanent, meaning closed bins might be merged if the space between them is closed with the addition of new sequences. How do bins compare to morphological species? For the paper describing the bin system, tests were done based on published barcode datasets. And they found that in most cases, there is a one-to-one -one relationship in some cases, one species is split into two or more bins, or two species correspond to only one bin, or there is a mixed pattern between species and bins. Why isn't there a complete match between species and bins across the animal kingdom? There are a few causes. Technical, in the lab where tubes or microplates get mixed up or there is cross-contamination, more human error is included in the taxonomic part, where misidentification can easily ha happen or synonyms are not detected. And I'm just reminding you again how important data validation is. But then there are biological causes too. There are cryptic species, closely related species, hybridization, introgression, and this can very well lead to discrepancy between species and beans. Probably one of the major advantages of the bin registry system is that each bin receives a page in bold with details pulled from the records belonging to that particular bin. As you can see here in these three bin pages, there is a taxonomic part up here and the orange, the orange color in this case means there are two species names in the same bin. There are images, there is a map, there is a histogram with intraspecific distances versus the nearest neighbor, all the publications that use that um, bin, a tree, a haplotype network, and then data about um, the collectors and the identifiers and the data owners. And now, after giving you so much information about BOLD, I'll end with the data lifecycle. Most, if not all, researchers involved in DNA barcoding will follow this workflow. Generate data, upload to BOLD, validate, analyze, and publish. And then close the chapter and move on to other studies and repeat the same workflow. However, I hope I gave you enough hints during this talk that data lives after publication. And not only that, but that it needs to be revisited. As more sequences and metadata are added, unidentified sequences might get a species name and old errors could be rectified. And I hope you all agree that curating data will benefit everyone, since the database is constantly used by many users, not only in the academic world, but in the regulatory environment, which requires more stringent data quality assurance. So please, if you see Anything that you consider to be an error in BOLD, please send an email to the BOLD team. And with this, I will thank you for your attention.